My name is Eleni Maruli, and I'm the head of market development at Ofcom. Uh, we sit in the strategy and research group, and we are responsible for providing the evidence base for all of our policymaking decisions. In addition to that, we're also responsible for doing horizon scanning for the organization to ensure that we are aware of what the markets that we regulate today will look like in five to 10 years. Uh, now today, uh, I'd like to take you through some of the initial uh, findings that we have in terms of the impact that the lockdown has had on UK audiences and the market. I'll touch a little bit on some of the market dynamics in the connected TV space. And then finally, I'll just comment very briefly on what we've done in terms of the TSB review uh, for which we published the consultation in December. So I'll quickly share my screen and we can begin. So in April, 2020, the average UK consumer watched six hours and 25 minutes of content every single day. Now that is a whopping surge. Uh, from the previous year of over an hour and a half. And you can see that the lockdown measures that were imposed in March 2020 um, was a tide that lifted all of the boats. So main beneficiary was SPOD, which more than doubled the time spent from the previous year. But you can see even segments like live TV, which has been declining very consistently over the last few years, grew quite significantly, as well as all other forms of video. What's interesting to note as well on this slide is that the majority of the content that is consumed by UK audiences continues to be broadcaster content. So that live TV, recorded playback, as well as BFOD. Now, what we don't see on the slide is that actually, even though it is a large majority, it's fallen quite significantly in terms of shares. So when I was at last presenting that slide, this slide a couple of years ago, that figure was 71%. So there might be a case to be made about maybe an acceleration in some of the structural changes that we have uh, seen in the TV market. Finally, the last thing just to point out on the slide is just uh, the status of uh, consumption of BVOD content. So we see that it grew just by one minute uh, year on year uh, in April 2020. Um, and that's actually been a consistent story over the last couple of years. Um, so although we have seen uh, growth in online propositions and online video, uh, BVOD doesn't seem to be part of that story. Now, we know that there are many discrepancies across uh, UK audiences by demographic. Um, we know that older uh, demographics tend to watch a lot more live TV. Um, however, what we also hear is that younger people are not watching any TV content, which is simply not true. You can see on the slide, uh, when we segment uh, the data by 1634s, um, they're still watching six hours and 21 minutes every single day, uh, which is just four minutes shy of the average. So they are very, very much content driven, content engaged uh, audiences. Now, the differences obviously from the average are in the composition of the content. So, whereas we had that 59% figure before, that goes down to 31% when we're looking at 1634s. Some other things to point out about their behavior. One, they've really upped their SPOC consumption by almost an hour year on year. That is now more than one and a half times the amount they spend watching live TV. Um, YouTube as well is very prominent in their uh, consumption diet. Uh, you see that they're spending over an hour every day watching YouTube content. Um, and finally, you can see as well that their other video, uh, as well as gaming, uh, is, is quite prominent uh, in terms of what millennials are doing uh, in terms of content consumption. Now, in addition to looking at things by demographic, it's always really helpful to also look at things over time. So um, I'd like to show you uh, a graph that we update quite regularly, uh, just so that we can see some of the uh, longitudinal changes in um, TV consumption across the UK. Now, this is live TV plus recorded playback, so it doesn't include uh, some of that uh, other video that you've seen in, in the donuts before. However, I think it's still quite a useful benchmark against which to, to think about TV viewing. Um, and you can see that over time, so for the last seven years, uh, that line, that amount of time daily viewing of TV has gone down consistently every year. So we started with 2014 and we've been down all the way to 2020. And you can see that the first uh, two months of the year looked very similar to what we would perhaps expect if we were gonna take an average of that decline year on year. However, we saw a steep rise as soon as lockdown measures were announced. And 
went back five years to 2015 in terms of the types of habits that we were exhibiting. Now, as the lockdown wore on and maybe uh, restrictions were lifted, um, the weather got warmer. This is something that impacts TV viewing quite significantly, as we know. Um, you can see that those curves are U-shaped, uh, and that, that's uh, very clearly because of, uh, uh, of temperature as well as sunshine hours. Uh, you can read uh, some interesting stuff on Barb's website about that. Um, those slipped down, and actually, even in August and September, um, supported by the Eat Out to Help Out campaign, um, viewing fell for the first time underneath uh, the 2019 line that we have over there, that orange line. However, it jumped back up um, as the restrictions were reimposed, and you can see that we've now gone back uh, to 2017 levels of viewing. So we're, we're three years behind uh, in terms of uh, changes in TV viewing that we've seen. Now, whether that will go back to that trajectory that I mentioned of continuous decline, uh, we don't know. We will see, but it's something that we're monitoring quite closely. Now, the eagle-eyed among you will have realized that this scale doesn't start at zero, uh, and this is done deliberately so that we can look at some of the changes over time. However, I'm by no means trying to overstate the decline in, in TV viewing. Um, if I were a business and you told me that I would have uh, engagement over three hours a day, uh, from UK audiences, I would definitely be want to be in that industry. Um, so just to reiterate that TV viewing continues to be a significant uh, proportion of time spent by um, UK audiences. So uh, just to uh, caveat that this, this graph for those who are on list and like to analyze these, uh, these types of tricks. In terms of what drove uh, the growth in, in TV viewing, uh, you can see that a lot of it was news. So we have some huge spikes, particularly at the beginning. Uh, but what's interesting is that those didn't go down as time went on. So you can see even by early summer, people were watching a lot of news in comparison to what we saw in 2018 and uh, 2019. So this is something that has really uh, buoyed um, the TV, uh, TV market throughout 2020. And it's probably very highly correlated with the growth of the PSB share of the total uh, TV viewing pie. So you can see that in March, um, uh, PSBs accounted for just shy of 59% of all TV viewing. Um, this has gone down uh, slightly uh, through June and the summer. However, they still account for a large majority of our viewing. Uh, and I think what this reflects is, is the UK audiences uh, trust that they have in the PSBs to deliver news uh, in a fair and an impartial way uh, as they audiences seek to, to continue to be informed um, as restrictions of, of lockdown change. Now, in terms of thinking about the question about whether this is a structural change or a cyclical change of blip or a consumer behavior that's here to stay. Um, what we tried to do is we tried to compare um, the level of viewing to that of 2019 over um, uh, the year, week by week. Um, now you can see that 2020 uh, on much viewing and broadcast TV was quite similar, slightly down perhaps um, to the previous year. And then we had that big jump in March. Um, now, as the year went on, broadcast TV sort of started coming down closer to 2019 levels, whereas the unmatched viewing, which includes things like SVOD, DVD viewing, gaming, um, and any other type of video that's consumed on the TV set, that gap stayed quite stable. So perhaps an early sign that this is a behavior that is here to stay, even as the pandemic um, uh, eventually ends. Uh, although not a trend by any means, it's, it's, it's just uh, the beginning of the series. It's something that we are monitoring closely. It's no surprise, it correlates quite highly as well with uh, this SVOD subscriptions. So um, even before lockdown, we know that uh, um, over half of all UK households had at least one SVOD subscription, um, and they were on track to continue on that growth trajectory. However, as uh, lockdown started, uh, uh, and restrictions were imposed, you can see that the gradient of those lines got steeper, it got larger. And so um, they were adding more and more users uh, to their services. Now, the uh, headlines were stolen by the launch of Disney Plus, which did better than um, anyone expected, even Disney themselves, um, became the third largest SVOT service in the UK. However, it's important, I think, to note and not to forget that actually a lot of the impact was also 
felt by Netflix and Amazon, the two largest as uh, services in the UK. And they have added quite a lot of subscribers as well and are really benefiting from that growth uh, throughout 2020 and into 2021. What's also interesting as well, and something that we look at quite a lot, is just the overlap in uh, services across households. Now, what's interesting is that those who are now Disney Plus subscribers had already been as well subscribers, basically all of them, 95%, you can see here. And so when we think about things like carrying capacity of SBOT services, SBOT stacking, um, this is something that there is still um, a bit of room for. Um, and so some of the additions were very much incremental rather than um, sort of creation of new demand in the SBOT space. Finally, uh, from a consumer perspective, um, something that we have been asking uh, UK consumers uh, every year is why they subscribe to SBOT services. You can see about three, four years ago, it was because they were trialing the services out, they were taking advantage of a promotion. But as these subs uh, subscription services have gotten more established, you can see that some of the marketing messages that they've been hammering home um, have really resonated with audiences. So audiences really value flexibility, which is that left-hand side of the graph over here. Um, they like to uh, control how they watch content, when and where. And finally, the content itself as well. So um, originals uh, are something that's cited as a, as a big reason for subscribing to Netflix and Amazon, um, exclusive content, as well as that back catalog. Um, now the elephant in the room is that green, uh, green bar on the, on the right. Of course, um, Amazon Prime continues to be uh, rated uh, and subscribed to for its delivery services, uh, free one day delivery service. However, that number has gone down. And actually, you can see now that half of people uh, think of Amazon Prime as a video service rather than a delivery service. But going back to that back catalog point, you can see why um, that's resonating uh, as a message um, across UK audiences. And it's because we see that the catalog has basically grown. Uh, the amount of hours of content available has consistently gone up since 2016 and is now uh, more than 110,000 hours that are available for, for um uh, users and subscribers to watch. So to our delight, what's great is that a significant minority of that is UK produced and UK originated. So um, UK audiences are able to uh, enjoy content that uh, reflects their society as well as that uh, international content that is available, particularly on, on the bigger subscription services. Switching now to what the TV um, ecosystem looks like now, we are just kicking off our 2020 data collection. So unfortunately I can only show you 2019 data, which is now quite old, but I'll try and allude to some of the uh, impacts that I, we, we expect to see in 2020 based on what stakeholders have told us. So in terms of first run uh, UK originated content across the PSBs, uh, it's been fairly stable over the last 10 years. It goes up and down a little bit. If it's an odd year, if it's an even year, odd years tend to be a little bit quieter because there aren't any significant supporting events usually, but it sort of fluctuates between 31,000 and 33,000 hours in terms of first run UK original content. It's new content that's being added and viewed by the UK audiences. Now spend looks a little bit different. Um, if you look at it as a long time series, it's actually decreased quite a lot by uh, over a billion pounds in the last uh, 15 years. Um, uh, however, if you look at it just in the recent uh, years, you'll see that it's it has been fairly stable. Now, again, this is um, presented in real terms. So we've removed inflation, which actually has been relatively high in the last few years, um, as well as we don't include third party funding, which has been growing quite significantly. So this includes things like co-productions, um, high-end uh, TV tax reliefs, as well as deficit funding. Um, and that, if you put that on top of this graph, you'll see that actually the uh, picture is a little bit more stable uh, rather than uh, declining. Um, in terms of what we expect to see in 2020, um, productions, a lot of productions halted at the beginning of the pandemic. And then uh, since the summer and onwards, uh, there have been new safety measures that have um, also delayed and uh, impeded some uh, productions, made them a little bit more difficult to do. So we expect that this figure will be significantly lower in 2020. Um, however, we'll have to report back in the summer when we get the data back. Finally, um, in terms of revenue, 2019 was a fairly stable year, although I think if we just look at the top line, um, 
you've missed some, some of the nuance here. So we did actually have some significant declines in pay TV and, and uh, TV advertising revenues, which were offset by their online counterparts. So the SFOD revenue as well as online advertising. Um, and in 2020, um, it will look even, uh, even more challenging. Um, we know that Q2 in particular for the TV advertising market was very difficult. Um, however, actually, um, most of the advertising agencies and, and, and the analyst houses have revised their uh, forecast upwards. So we're gonna see double digit decline in 2020 in TV advertising, but um, a little bit better than we had expected uh, at the beginning of the year. And there are perhaps some silver linings from this as well. I think um, what we saw in Q2 in particular is that all of a sudden advertisers who are maybe digital first or slightly too small, uh, that were priced out of the TV ad market were all of a sudden able to buy TV ad inventory, and they did. Uh, we had ads from Making Bacon, from Duolingo, um, from Zoflora. And so although these advertisers probably won't return to uh, linear TV in 2021 and beyond, um, they will be looking probably for some new TV advertising opportunities, um, which actually segues me quite nicely to my next section. Uh, around uh, connected uh, TV gateways. Now I'll preface this section by saying that we don't collect any data uh, on connected TV from the industry. Um, however, when we did our review of the electronic program guide uh, in the summer, uh, we did commission some work uh, to review the market dynamics in the connected TV space and to get a better understanding of how consumers access uh, and discover TV content. Um, so as you can see on the slide, um, the ecosystem is complex. Um, and as technology changes and behavior uh, of consumers evolves, um, it will get increasingly more complex. Now, I'm not trying to recreate a Lumascape chart here. I don't think that's helpful. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are multiple touch points here uh, to find the consumer from the manufacturers, um, so the Samsungs and the LGs, um, through to the operating services. Uh, operating systems, rather, um, so like your Android TVs and your Fire TVs, all the way through to the content environment. So the app within which you're watching your content, whether it's iPlayer or, or ITV Hub. Um, advertising, on the other hand, in the connected TV system is not new. It's existed for quite a while. Um, however, it has become more prominent um, and we're having more and more discussions on this. And I think that there are two reasons for this. Firstly, I think we are reaching a critical mass now of connected TVs. Um, people are not just buying connected TVs, but they actually are connecting them to the internet. So our technology tracker, which we have been running uh, for the last 15 years, which tracks uh, device adoption by UK audiences, shows us that 60% of UK households now have connected their TVs to the internet. Um, and then secondly, uh, what I think is also uh, a catalyst for uh, connected TV advertising is that um, various uh, market players across uh, the value chains are now interested in having discussions about this from the manufacturers all the way to the broadcasters. Um, and this is uh, probably um, uh, driven by uh, the fact that um, they are looking, the hardware manufacturers are looking for recurring revenue. Um, you know, hardware sales tend to be one off uh, and they happen every few years, whereas advertising can be uh, a kind of nice monthly boost uh, to an otherwise uh, uh, slightly uh, more up and down. Uh, market and, and then for broadcasters as well as they try to diversify and move away from their more traditional revenue generating means. Finally, um, I think some of the challenges as well are around uh, some of the uh, relationships within the connect connected TV advertising ecosystem. So um, there is some precedent for some agreements between different parties. However, it's a little bit inconsistent across markets. We know that there are some revenue share agreements uh, and the level of those revenue share agreements um, uh, has been set by some of the players uh, within the space, um, but it is something that's still being discussed and debated. And then finally, um, data is obviously incredibly important in this space, both in terms of targeting, uh, but also analytics and predicting and forecasting audiences. So there are opportunities for new players to come in and, and offer value um, to the ecosystem. So just very briefly before I leave you, um, I just wanted to note some things uh, about 
uh, what we have been doing in our small screen big debate work. Um, we, in December, as I mentioned, published our consultation for the uh, PSB review, which we have to do every five years. Um, and the kind of the most important takeaway from our research for that uh, review is that UK audiences still very much value public service content uh, for the reasons that you see on this slide. Um, what's really important for us is that we have to make sure that we design a framework that's both effective in getting that content to UK audiences, but also future-proof in that it can adapt to some of the big changes that are happening, particularly in technology, but also in consumer behaviors. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to put some links for you guys um, to some of the fantastic resources that we have on the Ofcom website, um, where you can access all, all of our data and our reports, you can have a further read. However, I'm very happy as well for, uh, for emails if you have any questions or queries about any of the data that I presented today. Um, but otherwise, I just wanted to say a big thank you uh, for the last 20 minutes for giving me your time, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your conference. Hi everyone, uh, happy to be here. My name is Aki uh, from StreamHub, and I think uh, I, re I recognize some of you from the uh, list, so hopefully you guys are good. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am the CEO and head of product for StreamHub. So today, um, I've been asked to uh, sort of think about the, the coming years for CTV um, you know, for, for the industry. And we have been a very active, let's say, proponent of uh, believing in CTV and its evolution. So as its name suggests, StreamHub is, you know, a hub of all data streams and also plays on the fact that it is uh, about streaming. And more and more, we see the uh, transformation of the world into, uh, into this area. So today, uh, I'm going to be looking into the Japanese broadcasters, uh, what we do for them, its data, and its collaborative model. And maybe that's a hint for how CTV uh, can sort of evolve in the coming years uh, using Japan's, what they're doing there as uh, some, you know, at least uh, to some degree, some hints. All right, so uh, let's crack, crack on. Uh, I'm going to turn myself off uh, so you guys can have the full pleasure of the presentation. And uh, voila, here we go. So... Uh, a little bit about us, uh, so that there's a bit of background. Uh, we've been uh, we're, uh, sorry, we've been live since 2015, uh, headquartered in London, and uh, myself and Sam are the sort of co-founders, and uh, we have a global team uh, of OTT, ad tech, and data backgrounds. Uh, in the ad tech side, we have uh, Jamie West, which some of you might know, um, and we have Simon Fell, uh, who's also kind of uh, helping us out uh, in in our positioning. So uh, we've been very fortunate over the years to be trusted by global household brands, uh, ranging from Disney and A and E and stuff uh, from uh, in the U.S. American markets uh, to all the way to the east to Japan, uh, where we are market leaders, uh, being used by all broadcasters and agencies there. So uh, we see the world uh, is full of problems, and we're here to uh, solve them. Uh, we call it the Big Data 2.0 era, where each broadcaster can now sort of have basic abilities to manage their data, to play with their data. But the problems, uh, you know, are, are sort of new problems start to arise. So the very first one, uh, which we have gathered from multiple, you know, sort of customers uh, over the years has been uh, wasteful metrics. And uh, these could be QoS metrics that go very deep, uh, things that are real time, which are not necessary, um, sort of very high level, uh, you know, very detailed reports. And we've been guilty uh, over the years for, for that as well and been streamlining a lot of the metrics over the time. So there's a lot of ways for metrics, which results in uh, sort of bad money spent. Siloed and disjointed systems. I think this, uh, we're all familiar. So many ad servers, so many SSPs, so many different DSPs, uh, DMPs, et cetera, et cetera, different analytics systems. Uh, you know, some are for web, some are for video, et cetera, et cetera. So you end up by having many disjointed systems or very siloed proprietary things that, uh, you know, by the time it's built, it's too late, uh, you know, Web 3.0 has come along. Uh, time and cost problems uh, with minimal differentiation. So you spend a lot of time building stuff, but at the end of the day, uh, it's actually pretty similar to you know your competitors. And uh, because you know uh, it's and it costs a lot of money, uh, it costs a lot of training. By the time all that is done, something new is there. So 
um, this is a hint to why in, in Japan, at least the industry has sort of come together a bit more in a similar way how, you know, Arkiva took over the sort of uh, transmission and broadcast facilities uh, as that was not a differentiation. And then, of course, there's the problem of data bo bottlenecks, uh, where data scientists, specialists, analysts, uh, 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 people who can play with the tools, get to the insights, but they are the bottlenecks, and uh, therefore, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of time for, for reports to come up. Um, you know, the daily sort of sales uh, desk person cannot just quickly create a report and do something quick and, you know, miss an opportunity. So th those kind of things. So uh, how are we approaching this? Uh, we are pursuing simplicity. Uh, we just believe that there needs to be uh, as much as possible, where possible, to unify a system. And uh, uh, our answer is that let's at least unify the analytics and the uh, targeting parts of, of this in one solution that's seamless. Um, so. Uh, you know, we, 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 we tend to believe that there's three areas that can be unified. It's the robust data collection part, which is the SDKs or data lakes access, uh, the analytics and insights part, the part that makes sense out of it all. Uh, and the more automated this becomes for machine learning uh, through, uh, you know, just more, uh, let's say, customer driven algorithms that uh, we can build quickly. And then, of course, all that data and insight needs to be targetable. All that data needs to go back into the system and to uh, make money uh, for you know for for uh, for the, the OTT service, whether it's by uh, increasing satisfaction of the audiences through better engagement, through better recommendations, or through much more uh, sort of targeted uh, advertising, which is uh, uh, you know relevant, a more relevant user experience. So these are the kind of things we have in mind whilst we uh, you know that, or at least has become more apparently as we've worked a lot in the Japanese and other markets uh, in Europe and the U.S. So. Uh, simplicity is also in our analytics where, you know, we don't need to go deep, super, super deep. Um, everyone has just sort of come back, guys, we don't want to pay a high price. We want just one service that goes for uh, all key analytics. Now, AVOD, SVOD, TVOD Live, it's got to be service agnostic. That's a, a no-brainer, of course, all devices. But of course, uh, you know, rather than having two or three different systems that does just QoS, just does ads, just does live, uh, just does like very deep CRM audience. They just want something that's even if it's simple uh, to have all of it in one um, one one uh, one shop, should we say? Not to say that we are doing this in a very simple way, but uh, we are trying to make it uh, simpler for sure. Uh, then there's the of course part of the activation. So you know all that data that whether it's coming from the broadcaster, whether it's coming from a JIC, uh, you know, can be used in the very same way as DMPs around the world have been working but you know, based on third party data. So the focus here is that let's do everything we can to maximize the value of your first party data. So it's about deep, segment deep segmentation, reporting, uh, inventory forecasting, targeting, you name it. And this is just a simple picture of how typical uh, segmentation could look like uh, based on PPID, uh, you know, as cookies and IDFAs and all that's gonna go away. So uh, the flow uh, that we've managed to achieve in Japan is very much around uh, this sort of, uh, you know, how do we build audience satisfaction and monetization? How can we get the actions needed for it? How can we get the data manipulated in a way that's useful all the time across all the different teams? So the analytics side of things uh, is about simplicity. One integration for all video metrics, quick and easy reports to democratize the data across the teams and agencies and uh, uh, research companies and whatnot, and then for each broadcaster to be able to go deep into their own data for, you know, editorial uh, sort of user retention, uh, you know, thinking of ways that they can create higher yields and CPMs, and then, of course, uh, for a lot of personalized marketing, uh, win-back campaigns, uh, you know, cancellation, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, stopping and all those things. Uh, so the uh, benefits is that uh, the... Uh, well, the benefit of all this is that the easier it is to use the data, the bigger the benefits are. And uh, we we know this because in Japan, we've managed to already boost a lot of the CPMs uh, for, for the broadcasters who use us. Um, the hyper-targeting is kind of a daily thing that's happening through the uh, segmentation platform. Really deep stuff like, you know, I want all users who watch the uh, five full seasons of Game of Thrones, who, but who have not watched season six yet. <laughs> Uh, things like that. Um, and then, uh, of course, all that data can be used to rethink the strategies, what kind of content should be cleared, what are the main segments that I should be satisfying versus others can be sacrificed, etc., uh, etc. Et so uh, a lot of good stuff going on. 
So uh, how do the you know how do the people uh, use it on a daily basis? So I talked about user friendliness um, and the fact that it's service agnostic, so ready for any CTV service. So this is the kind of a, a typical dashboard that has been created for a set of customers, and uh, you know it can work with AVOD, SVOD Live, uh, RPD set top box data, HPV TV data logs, and you know whatever that might already exist or whatever you want to be tracked uh, new. So this was a key thing in Japan because so many different broadcasters already had so many different tags in it. Um, then, of course, uh, the ad audit part was super important because, you know, at the end of the day, the data that we handle for the JICs and the research companies or even for, you know, individual broadcasters is going to be uh, what's what's used for uh, getting the bills, like right, getting the bills paid. So for us, uh, absolute data cleansing uh, measures, you know, making sure that data is absolutely spot clean, no uh, sort of duplicates or bad entries. Um, and also making sure that those ads are being delivered, in fact, uh, by adding our QoS sort of audit um, module in it. Then um, this is a little bit of a glimpse into the segmentation tool, uh, but I think many of you are familiar with uh, sort of first party DMP, so I won't bore you too much with it, except to say that we try to keep, uh, you know, just enough detail for people to be able to make quick decisions to commit to campaigns or to commit to marketing um, and, and so forth. Okay, uh, so this is to give you uh, some, uh, just so that uh, we're not talking uh, completely out of our asses, like, and this is like kind of the customer base that we uh, we have uh, around the world. And um, then on to one of these customers. Um, actually, in fact, this is a representative customer of all the broadcasters we have in Japan. I just used uh, sort of Portugal's Impresa uh, because they are mirroring exactly what we do for uh, many of the broadcasters in Japan. And this is how we, we, we began. It's by providing a full OTT analytics and first party DMP for uh, some tier one broadcasters. Uh, a typical setup is that they'd be multi-platform, you know, web, iOS, Android, etc. cetera. Uh, this is kind of common now. Um, many of uh, customers in Japan follow a AVOD S1 and Live hybrid model from the get-go. And many are very fussy about what kind of custom development they want. Uh, but fortunately, being a sort of a global enterprise SaaS platform, Many of the things that we develop for a couple of customers becomes globally available um, to, to everyone because uh, like that, we jointly evolve globally uh, as a sort of a broadcaster or OTT focused platform. Now, uh, the key thing that uh, has been a super uh, helpful thing for, for our broadcast in Japan and uh, in Europe and elsewhere is that we have from the get-go been providing a total solution uh, that uh, is feasible for post cookie and device idless world. So everything is user a consented user data user base um, uh, with PPIDs at the center of everything. So you know as cookies uh, disappear this year and uh, device IDs are becoming flakier, uh, PPID uh, for us we have a very strong infrastructure around that that we're providing in Japan. So. Um, Case study number two then is about the actual what's happening as a collaborative platform uh, for the entire industry. So um, I'm going to go into this now and um, just as a sort of a means of background, I wanted to take you through the Japanese media market. So uh, everything is uh, compared to the UK double. So double the people, double the uh, total ad markets. Um, double the TV ad markets, but not double the web ad markets. Uh, that is relatively still a nascent market in Japan, which is very exciting for us. Um, the broadcast numbers, they are actually also about double, uh, with sort of the ITV equivalents being sort of uh, NTV and TBS. Um, now, on the right side, I have the OTT players. Uh, who are the dominant players in OTT? Uh, I think this is a very familiar, uh, except maybe that Netflix is not on here in Japan. Uh, but YouTube is hugely dominant uh, through their mix of uh, legal and illegal content. Um, then there's Abema TV, which is sort of a joint venture between uh, sort of a, an, a kind of a, a tech, a Japanese tech giant and a broadcaster, which is doing relatively well. But um, um, it's it's mainly small short clips. Uh, then of course there's Prime and other guys and Hulu as well. But uh, in here the only pure let's say BVOD or AVOD sort of platform is Tiver. Now, uh, which is in about fourth place, and there's a relatively big gap with the top three. Now, um, I want to slightly, add, uh, by the way, Tiver is kind of like a Hulu, uh, or um, which is, uh, but only with AVOD, a uh, catch up service. And this is what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, but just bear with me to, so I can give you a slightly deeper broadcaster only OTT ecosystem. Okay, um, 
so first, this first group on the left uh, is sort of the B AVOD and SVOD guys. So all the own media operated uh, AVOD and SVOD services, there's many. There's a lot more than this, actually, in fact. Uh, there's been some move towards consolidation for some SVOD services because they are basically struggling to get any users. And roughly speaking, across everyone, um, we're looking at about 5 million sort of monthly uniques, which is very small. On the contrary, we have the uh, YouTubes and the Gaos and other guys, uh, and of course, Amazon, etc., which gives about 80 million plus active users. And they do a mix of TV content as well as, you know, special uh, sort of interest films, music, etc. And of course, then there's Tiver, which as a sort of a standalone entity, uh, which is purely BVOD, is kind of the standout uh, sort of winner amongst the group. And it's uh, uh, up to about 50 million. Uh, as of last year, so probably uh, going towards 17, 18, 20 million this year, which is uh, a pretty good number. Now, uh, let's take a look at Tiva. Um, oh, sorry. So a very uh, quick sort of overview of it is that it's um, a hip new brand. Uh, you know, the, it's the broadcasters who kind of come to, came together and wanted to create a new brand like Netflix, which is cool and hip and more towards sort of the younger and sort of uh, 30s uh, sort of audiences. Um, it's a, a catch-up service with all the premium TV content uh, available to seven, from seven to 30 days, uh, anytime, anywhere, and it's, and it's free, of course, and with a very little registration information required. Uh, the, on the monetization side, it's uh, purely ad-based ad uh, with unskippable ads for 90% of it and some new formats creeping in as well. Now, the three big circles here are key points to how the Tiver has been a success in Japan. Um, it's that each channel decides on what content lineup it wants to put into it. And this is based on the data that they receive, uh, you know, through this kind of JIC Stream Hub uh, collaboration. And of course, each channel sells their own inventory as well. So imagine, you know, if you're uh, channel number one or channel number two, you'd have different ad servers, different, uh, slightly different pricing, uh, different types of uh, ad products, um, but all based out of the data that's coming out of this joint uh, sort of uh, alliance platform. And of course, the, the big win for agencies is that uh, they can sell the big pool. So not only from Tiver, but from all the broadcasters, uh, you know, all the data comes in and um, it's a single standard. So that can basically be used for the planning as well as targeting. So the benefits are that uh, there's a huge boost in CPMs. Uh, now in the, in the most recent uh, months, I've heard that it's uh, somewhere fetching 25 plus, which is a big uh, step forward as TV in Japan is $6 as well as the, the, at the beginning of Tiver's life, it was around that, that uh, value as well. Uh, much bigger pool uh, to uh, basically compete against the Googles and the Facebooks uh, of, of Japan. And uh, of course, there's full control and transparency, uh, making it sort of a, a kind of a clear non-competing, sorry, a clear competing part, which doesn't sort of fall into antitrust laws. Uh, there's shared cost, um, risk and reward, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And most importantly, for many broadcasters, is that this has become a huge source of first-party data, um, which is sort of fully consented as well, uh, and uh, and the kind of has that premium sort of feel compared to all the YouTube and Facebooks. Now, um, what we have enabled is that we've been uh, very uh, fortunate to enter a strong partnership with J Japan's JIC, uh, uh, similar to Kantar and uh, sort of uh, Barb. And we have enabled uh, the, through them uh, the, so that the Japanese broadcasts can use this currency OTT data beyond measurement and use it for targeting. Roughly about 1 billion video views per month is what we do. Processing data every day. Uh, 13, bro and 13 broadcasters are using it. Uh, four different platforms that I mentioned Tiva earlier on, but there's these other sort of, uh, let's say, BVOD friendly uh, platforms. And then uh, five major agencies uh, there are a couple more here, but uh, these are the guys who are commanding 80 to 90 percent of the revs on OTT. So uh, this is the only technical slide, I swear, that I will uh, go into. But this is uh, giving you a shared, fully integrated data platform, uh, a view of how this uh, fully integrated uh, and shared platform is created. And how um, basically from all the data here, we have the analytics part that basically spits out ads and programs data reports. It fuses to the currency panel of one million users. Uh, and then all this data goes into the activation uh, sort of DM, first party DMP, uh, which is used for planning a segment uh, and segmentation. But uh, all uh, or each of the broadcaster members can then bring their first party data securely uh, only for their own uh, viewing and uh, segmentation into this to enrich their propositions. 
And the same can be said about uh, second party data from clients that each broadcaster sales house brings and so forth. And this data uh, is then, of course, uh, integrated into SpotX, Freewell, etc. Uh, rather than each broadcaster doing so many different integrations, through StreamHub, they have a single integration for any ad server if they want to switch you know, overnight or try out different ad servers at any time. And of course, uh, the agency desks uh, also have the information in real time uh, going to them for information. So um, the result is good. Uh, it's a growing, still growing phase. It's still nascent, but uh, overall revenues are up. And of course, the CPMs are up as well. So that's been really, really uh, a fortunate thing for, um, you know, for the industry as a whole. And for us, we've been really uh, uh, grateful to be part of it. So uh, that's it uh, in terms of kind of a quick glimpse of uh, how this collaborative platform is working. And I have some questions that uh, I've prepared actually <laughs> from recent sessions uh, and having chatted to Vincent as well. And uh, these are a couple of things that might be piquing your interest. So uh, what do the privacy laws in Japan look like? And it's, is this model workable in Europe with GDPR? Uh, I saw hell yes. Uh, we, uh, our platform is actually built in the UK and um, you know our first customers were in Europe so we were uh, very GDPR uh, conscious from the beginning. And of course, Japan uh, is uh, in its course for implementing equally uh, strict, if not more strict rules than GDPR. So yes, it's fully interchangeable. It can be deployed into any market and we can tweak uh, any of these privacy related things uh, uh, in, our, in our platform. Uh, another question we got was how much more are broadcasters able to charge using this form of targeting? I think uh, in the use case, uh, in the case study, uh, both the first one and the second one, uh, it's all about boosting up the CPMs, uh, improving the yield. So uh, the fact is that it's uh, already got like a sort of yeah, a kind of a huge uplift in the CPMs uh, over the years. So that that's a, that's a no brainer. Um, so six, you know, uh, having gone from six dollars to twenty to twenty five dollars, uh, so in a space of about three years, uh, has been a good thing. Then the last question we got was, do the market leaders express concern around pooling their data? Yes, certainly. This, the, the bigger ones, especially, that have invested a lot into user registration, etc., have. But the good thing is that uh, all that first-party data that is brought into the platform is only siloed into their view. And that will never become shareable unless, of course, that broadcaster expressly says, oh, yes, I want to share it with other others. The other part regarding the viewing log data is that uh, uh, whilst everyone can see what uh, you know, the popularity of content and rankings of content of other uh, competitors, uh, when they go and create the segments, they cannot specify any program. So they can only specify genres, which are very large and wide. So I can say, hey, I want users who watch ITV. And if I was Channel 4, I'd be like, you know, um, I want all users who watch the sports genre on ITV. And on Channel 4, uh, you know, uh, we're watching some other drama. So, uh, yeah, uh, so all those access management uh, features are in place as well, which has been a uh, kind of a, a very good thing for us. All right, uh, so those are the questions. Uh, any more questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, thank you. Okay, we're going to jump into the SVOD market. Uh, even though this conversation is focused primarily on advertising, I think everyone realizes that SVOD is very much competition for eyeballs. Um, over the last year or so, we've seen Disney uh, launch a, a global assault on Netflix's global business. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to talk about you know this competition as if it's a zero-sum game where one obliterates the other and the other doesn't exist. But... Which of the two companies do you think is the, the most likely contender at the moment to come out on top as a, the global leader for SVOD? Well, um, the thing about SVOD is that what was clear before the pandemic became crystal clear during the pandemic, that the best entertainment television is being done on SVOD and that uh, traditional broadcast and cable channels are no longer the place to go for the highest quality television. And uh, that's Netflix, that's uh, Disney Plus, um, uh, that's uh, HBO uh, Max, uh, that is uh, even Hulu, 
which does have an AVOD component, uh, but uh, is SVOD in the sense that uh, to get it at all, you have to pay a subscription fee, even though there's a lower price for those who uh, uh, are willing to, to take ads. And the combination of all of, of that viewing, uh, coupled with uh, some lesser um, uh, SVOD uh, streaming services uh, like uh, Showtime, um, uh, and it creates a situation where um, while there's a lot of focus on AVOD, one has to question between the existing linear world, which certainly is suffering from substantial cord cutting and decline in audiences, but is still um, but in, in the United States, uh, traditional cable and satellite is over 60% of homes. And when you add skinny bundles into that, um, so-called digital skinny bundles that are still carrying the linear television channels, that's uh, over 70% of homes. And you add that to the SVOD, no advertising support. The AVOD world, with all the focus it gets, is still pretty small. And there's a big question there, I think, when we peel through the reality of how big the AVOD market's going to be, um, something that really is not getting quite as much focus among media analysts as it should. To your question on Netflix versus Disney, um, I went out on CNBC recently and I, uh, at the time of uh, Netflix uh, last earnings report a couple weeks ago, which was, uh, in my mind, truly outstanding, confirmed uh, what I thought, though I thought this earnings report confirmed it, that Netflix will be by far the most valuable media company in the world. Um, and that isn't to say that Disney is not going to be a meaningful competitor in the SVOD streaming wars. And it doesn't mean that the Disney global brand uh, isn't going to be a way for Disney to be probably head and shoulders among uh, others who are trying to transform their linear media companies into the digital streaming world. But Netflix just has a superior business model one and two, its success involves no downside baggage. What you got to remember about Disney, and it's true for all the traditional players that are trying to transform themselves, the disruption that they suffer as a result of streaming, including their own efforts, uh, accelerate the decline of their linear business. And so success in streaming brings with it real downdraft that has to be taken into account relative to the ultimate value of those companies with Netflix streaming success is all success without that factor. Yeah. I, I, do you think Netflix will seek you know, alternative sources of revenues in order to generate that growth? I mean, advertising is one thing that we frequently talk about, you know, and speculate about. Uh, it never seems to happen. Um, and you know, I've you know been told before by Netflix that it won't happen for quite some time if, if it happens at all, or if it does, it might be a different brand. Um, do you feel that they have to grow? I mean, you know, you talk about the, the, the baggage of Disney, but th th there's also assets uh, and established, you know, merchandising and, and all those type of things, those other revenue sources. Do you think Netflix will ultimately go down a similar path to generate growth, or will its current model be enough? Well, its current model is incredibly strong, and I don't think they would or should go down the path of advertising unless, as you say, it's a totally different brand, because the price value perception of Netflix is astoundingly strong. And, you know, it, it, it's not just that Disney uh, Plus has about half the subs at about half the ARPU. It is the, the, the um, engagement in programming time that Netflix is able to generate is probably five times or more greater than, 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 than Disney Plus uh, in the homes that they're both in. And um, it is the buzziness of Netflix original programming. So they've been able to uh, continue to raise price 
demonstrating that they have a very substantial perception of value. Part of that value is that you don't have to wade through commercials. Um, they have a budget uh, that is putting pressure on the entirety of the rest of the industry, including Disney, which basically started off when it announced its streaming plans, talking about something in the area of a budget of $4 billion, which under pressure from Netflix and what it means to be in this global game has already been brought up to about $8 billion. But uh, Netflix this year is probably going to be 17 to 18 billion on its way to a 20 billion dollar programming budget. Now, when you stop and consider what a 20 billion dollar a year programming budget means, it means that it can probably introduce a new movie or a new television series each and every day. And that creates an ability to hold your audience, not churn. And remember, churning in a digital environment is a whole lot easier than it was in the cable satellite world where disconnect is much more of a difficult proposition. And Netflix ability to uh, create that greater engagement through its programming budget, its ongoing price value perception, its ability to continue to raise price. And then two other elements, one, real strong international distribution. You know, there was a lot of focus on Disney's headline number of subscribers, and they've done very well out of the box with subscribers, no doubt. But about a third of those subscribers come from Hotstar in India, where the ARPU is probably well under a dollar uh, versus a uh, average ARPU for uh, Netflix in the 10 to $11 range or, or around the globe. And if Netflix had, uh, uh, when people looked under the hood, had that much of its growth coming from very small ARPU India subs, people would have screamed holy, holy murder about, oh my God, Netflix can't be worth anything close to what people say it is. And yet with Disney, uh, it was hardly uh, uh, taken note by investors who looked at the headline number and uh, basically weren't focused on the fact that those are uh, pretty limited uh, uh, ARPU subs. Moreover, much of that India audience comes from sports, which are rights that Disney rents, doesn't own. It's not uh, innate to the Disney brand type of distribution. So a lot of differences relative to Netflix, which has done such an incredible job of local production and driving local content in the form of originals uh, in various markets where Disney's strategy, at least to date, seems to be focused on the, the, the Disney well-known uh, brands, Star Wars, Marvel, et cetera, without really getting into distinctive localization of product. And so you put all that together and it is very hard particularly given the linear downdraft that Disney has to manage to look at that and say that they're even comparable business models. Yes, Disney does have certain ways of generating revenue through mer merchandising and parks and Netflix doesn't have that. Um, having, and if there is one area that I see Netflix getting into, um, I could see them getting into merchandising given the strength of some of their shows. Imagine if in the Queen's Gambit uh, chess uh, branded uh, Queen's Gambit chess sets, uh, given the huge global uptick in chess buying that took place uh, following the release of that show, uh, there are some clear ways that they can uh, drive a different source of revenue through that kind of activity. And um, what about the other players? You're, you're all friends at NBC and uh, Comcast. Um, Peacock has come fairly strong out of the blocks so far. It's have had a, a good start, I think. Um, do you, do you not place much faith in, in models like that for building out the AVOD market? Well, it, it's not that um, I don't think that uh, Peacock is a pretty interesting model when you have the largest cable operator in the United States uh, uh, being able to push that out and uh, alliances with other cable operators pushing that out. And um, um, it's a... Um, free in a lot of those markets and uh, small uh, pay in markets where uh, that may not be the case. And, um, you know, it's actually done a very good job with its initial distribution. People lose sight of the fact that with the big headline numbers of how many subs Disney has, uh, 
including its India subs. In the United States, it has 35 million subs, uh, which is not a small task, but Peacock, which launched uh, much more recently um, and uh, certainly has not put quite the uh, uh, programming budget by any means behind it, is probably in the high 20 range of uh, sub subscribers. And so against that comparison, uh, Disney's probably not done quite as well as people really believe it has Disney Plus in the US and Peacock's uh, probably done better. I think the issue with the AVOD market is how many players are in there. And as I said, given the linear world coupled with the SVOD world, um, and I didn't include Amazon when I was discussing the, the uh, SVOD world and what Amazon can do potentially uh, with advertising as YouTube, which next to Netflix is the second largest um, garner of a streaming audience uh, in, in, in the US. And obviously that's a advertising market that is uh, uh, principally one that others don't participate in really. And so uh, you have your biggest advertiser supported streaming media audience, uh, not really what I would count up for grabs in the AVOD market that people have to think about. And then when you, when you consider what that AVOD market is, uh, it's, uh, I think largely going to be dominated by Hulu um, on, again, a, a, a hybrid SVOD, AVOD service. Um, you're going to have uh, uh, Peacock in there. You are supposedly going to have an HBO Max advertising version in there. Uh, then you get into these um, bundles of uh, uh, free streaming services uh, like uh, uh, 2B, uh, and Pluto, um, uh, and uh, you then have the Roku uh, channel, which is a component of uh, uh, the Roku uh, mix, and you 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 put what how, how what a small slice AVOD may be of future viewing, and how many participants there are in that market, and uh, everybody can't end up with. Um, huge multi-billion dollar valued businesses, I think, off the back of that. Yeah. Let's stay on that topic of valuations because you know, we started off speaking about the stimulus and I think one of the sort of results of, of that has been that there's been lots of cash flying around and people have been, particularly retail investors, have been investing in the stock markets and we've seen all sorts of very entertainingly crazy valuations. Um do any in particular jump out to you in our space, particularly in the sort of yeah, media and advertising space as being you know, more overvalued than, than most? Uh, well, you know, it's in a, in a market with uh, zero to at negative interest rates and uh, all kinds of monetary stimulus and all kinds of uh, fiscal stimulus, as I mentioned, um, uh, it's uh, very hard to know what the value of any company really is against that backdrop. And um, I think uh, anything that looks like it's been um, grown during the pandemic has gotten an extra boost. And in streaming media, you uh, have a view that uh, this is a, uh, this is just accelerated secular change and those companies are gonna come out even stronger. And so they're getting a, uh, um, a back, to, back to normal boost as well. Uh, but I, I look at something like Roku, which is clearly establishing itself as a clear device winner in the uh, streaming world, certainly in the United States, and beginning to show uh, opportunity uh, internationally in that regard. Uh, but um, device manufacturer margins don't really make you a 50, 55 billion dollar business. And that's basically gar gotten its uh, valuation over the prospects of its ad sales. It takes a, a piece of the bounty when it sells subscriptions on its platform. But most of that is viewed on the growth of AVOD. Now, if you look at the world today, 
where I do believe SVOD is only going to get more competitive in terms of taking audience share because of the budgets that are continuing to grow in a way that uh, the, the best of programming and more and more original programming and Netflix moving to an original movie or series every day. Um, I, I, I have a hard time seeing against that backdrop AVOD audiences uh, growing that substantially. Certainly the continued decline of linear advertising will help at some, but you look today where Roku's had a early lead and it's got about 1% of streaming minutes, which is probably less than half percent of all television time watched. Now in the United States, a cable channel that had uh, one half of 1% of viewing would uh, have a hard time with a pretty good model where half of its money was coming in through advertising and half through uh, subscriber fees that had uh, total flow through margin compared to advertising where your margin on ad dollars is considerably less. Um, a, something that had a half of a, of a, a 1% uh, rating could be worth $3 billion, $5 billion, maybe. And now we're talking about something that's worth $53 billion. So there's a lot of hopes built up in terms of how investors are looking at what the value is of a device that can leverage substantial amount of inventory from those that want to get on its device to the television set. And yes, that's a meaningful role to play in the future television ecosystem. Is it anywhere close to 53 billion? If it's based off the back of advertising revenues, I have a hard time getting there. I mean, if you could play God and you were given full power to do whatever you wanted with the international TV industry and you were, you were given a mandate to, you know, come up with a, a, a solid AVOD opposition, what would be the first thing you would do? Is it simply that consolidation is required in order for all these different companies to survive? Or is there still perhaps strength in producing more localized content? You know, maybe a local Swedish company will be able to provide, you know, they'll just provide a, a different type of service that's more localized, where they have more, you know, understanding of cultural nuances and things like that. Well, um, if my analysis is right, that uh, there's going to be the linear television world is still going to garner meaningful audience. Uh, the SVOD world is going to continue to drive uh, huge budgets, which are going to drive um, massive amounts of the streaming audience to in the SVOD world. And uh, AVOD against that backdrop is going to be more and more splintered as more and more free lin uh, streaming linear channels come into the mix um, and overall amount of time spent on AVOD services um, is not going to substantially grow. Again, putting YouTube and Hulu AVOD in a, in a separate bucket and some of the big guys uh, like Peacock um, or HBO Max advertising being able to uh, substantially drive uh, the, the, the high end of the AVOD market. Uh, given what's left, um, you really, if you can't do it on, on volume, you got to do it on, on pricing. And to do it on pricing, you got to do a, a hell of a job with targeting. And I'm not sure the AVOD world, which has gotten a lot of money flowing into it, and most of the gains it's had has been actually in volume uh, so far, not in pricing, um, because the growth um, of, you know, just more and more uh, homes cutting the cord, getting a streaming device, having access to streaming television uh, has increased the audience against which AVOD opportunities can be presented. Uh, I think a lot of it is going to have to be off the back of price and targeting has to improve immensely. And you really, television has never done a good job of um, really developing uh, great 
targeted advertising where you're going well beyond demos and you're really getting at the essential ingredients of how an audience um, can be um, dissected to deliver uh, a, uh, a degree of efficiency which will justify far superior pricing. Now, the problem with that is, is that um, the, the, the better your targeting gets, you got to worry about what happens to the rest of that audience that gets sold in a traditional linear environment against uh, demographics that in a targeting world, you can't totally discard uh, because there may not be that many truly efficient targets within any particular uh, slice of, of uh, linear uh, of streaming AVOD audience. And so within that, there are pricing dynamics that uh, really need to get some sophisticated treatment. But in the end of the day, look, I'm chairman of Captify. Uh, Captify has probably got more targeting juice uh, than anyone because it's all built off the back of the largest reservoir of search data uh, that exists in the world other than Google. And with that search being such a better indication of intent and desire and the journey of a consumer than anything else. Uh, but uh, uh, bringing that kind of data into the AVOD world to increase the superiority of targeting to me is gonna be essential for AVOD to really reach the kind of valuations that people are putting against it. Tom, we're out of time. And uh, yeah, it's been an absolute joy as always. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. Cheers. Pleasure. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Tim Cross. I'm senior reporter at Video Week, and this is our panel um, looking at what does the next generation of broadcasters and platforms look like. I think it's pretty well accepted now that um, we need to see some sort of evolution uh, from broadcasters over the coming years. Um, Ofcom, towards the end of last year, for example, uh, put out a statement talking about like the necessity of evolution for broadcasters to even survive, which is um, pretty heavy words and we also are seeing movement on that front from the broadcasters um, in the UK for example Channel 4 towards the end of last year um, released their Future 4 I think it was called Strategy which is looking at how they're planning to evolve and adapt to a more CTV first world um, in the next five years um, obviously ITV with Planet V has made some interesting moves on the on the sales side of things so we are seeing transformation um, and then obviously you've got the newer entrants as well um, who are kind of becoming more and more established so uh, on this panel, we're kind of going to be looking at what um, that evolution is going to be looking like and making a bit of an assessment of the progress we're making. So I guess picking up on that point specifically, um, you know, we have been talking for a long time about how broadcasters should and are evolving. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm getting a sense that it's important now more than ever. Um, why, why do you think... Um, you know, right now it's particularly important that broadcasters should be evolving rather than just having this be a conversation that it would be nice to do this, but we're not actually making any changes. Shall I jump in? So I'm Katie Copeman. I head up ad sales for Discovery in the UK um, and Ireland. Um, so I guess I'm pretty well placed to talk about this. Um, you know, I think COVID in particular has accelerated viewing behaviours that were already that had already begun. You know, we all know that linear viewing is declining, although much slower than some people like to think, but it is still declining. But as we've seen this enormous growth of um, viewing to on demand, both in terms of SVOD and AVOD um, in the last kind of 12 months, it's really put the pressure on broadcasters like ourselves to make sure that we're future proofing our businesses. So I think that's why we've sort of there's an increasing focus at this at this time on accelerating um, those kind of where are we going to be in the next three to five years time really from a viewing perspective and and so where that's where our content needs to be so that that's kind of my thoughts on why it's so important now. 
So um, just to build on that, Katie, so my name's Emma Newman. I'm the CRO of uh, EMEA for Pubmatic. Um, I think that it's, it's almost impossible to have a conversation about anything at the moment without talking about COVID. But I do think that, you know, it has been the trigger point, if you like, for that acceleration um, from a broadcast perspective in, the ch- in terms of the change of viewing habits, right? So we've definitely seen it over 2020 where more people are at home and, you know, they're engaging more in, you know, linear and also connected television. Um, I don't think that that behavior is going to change dramatically. I think connected television, OTT, CTV has got a new audience now that perhaps it didn't have um, at the beginning of uh, 2020. And I don't think those audiences are necessarily going to go back to their old, to their old viewing habits. So I think that that's definitely you know, broadcasters need to think about that because obviously it's a fundamental change in how consumers are consuming uh, television. I do think that um, we are seeing an increase in uh, the choice of ad-supported CTV content options. Um, And I think advertisers have already started to follow the eyeballs by shifting some linear TV budgets to CTV. Uh, I don't think that, you know, the budgets are moving as quickly as perhaps the eyeballs are, but you know, you see that all the time. There's generally a lag. It's just how, I guess, how big is the lag going to be? Or in fact, in this instance, how short is the lag going to be? And I think that's what's going to help determine also what broadcasters need to do in order to think about being more adaptable and flexible um, as we move into 2021 and beyond. I can pick this up. Um, so I'm Justin Gupta. I lead broadcast partnerships for UK and Ireland at Google. Um, and my primary focus is enabling advanced video advertising, working with broadcasters. And I think 2020 was a, a leap year for broadcasting in so many ways. I think consumer adoption, as, as both uh, Emma and Katie said, has jumped forwards some, something between three to five years. And I think the main impact has been connected TV advertising has now hit a material scale. It's between 20 and 40 percent for most broadcasters. Um, it's available via digitally enabled services. And we also have quite a few digital first services now with ads. So, for example, Google are doing dynamic ad insertion with Katie's team for Golf TV. And we also are working with sports broadcaster DAZN. And I think from the advertiser perspective, they're really struggling to reach their audiences with Linear alone now. And broadcasters can help advertisers by enabling this addressable advertising more broadly. I think um, I think there's definitely, you know, as we've already discussed, very strong arguments for why evolution is important now. But we do definitely still see some lag, both on the buy side, as Emma mentioned, in terms of money going that way, and also on the sell side in terms of broadcasters transforming their own businesses. So I just want to explore quickly why why we're kind of seeing a bit of slowness in, in movement. Um, Emma, maybe we'll come to you first. Obviously, uh, Video Week and Pubmatic put out some some research looking at the state of uh, sort of CCV in Europe recently, which I would highly recommend to everyone who hasn't downloaded it yet. Um, so maybe uh, would you would you talk a little bit about sort of what we saw in that in terms of why um, you know the evolution is a bit slow? I think that many TV industry, a lot of the TV industry respondents that responded to that research, um, and thanks very much for the plug, by the way, much appreciated. <laughs> they were, I think, they were hamstrung by, by internal competition. Um, and, you know, and a core continued focus on the core revenues generated through linear TV advertising. Now, YCTV is universally acknowledged as a growth area. Development is under-resourced compared to the magnitude of change imposed by the diffusion of connected devices and new market entrants. So I think that in some instances, you know, there is this kind, there is this conflict. And, you know, I'm not sitting in a broadcaster, so these guys probably be able to comment upon this more. But, you know, there's sort of this like... You know, CTV is this sort of upstart, if you like, and you've got this 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 very established linear television that generates a huge amount of revenue for anybody involved in that space. So it's about trying to, you know, understand. I hear a lot that it's, you know, linear or CTV. And I think uh, Justin touched on this as well. I don't think it is either or. I think it's it's how do you how do they both work together? You know, a consumer watches both you know I watch linear television and I watch connected television I'm sure everybody else does as well so it's about how do you how do you bring connected television into your media plans and and that's really about understanding what what's the role that it plays so you know for for wanting to you know teach granny how to suck eggs it's kind of old-fashioned media planning and buying really 
So like, what role does it play? Where does it sit in the ecosystem? You know, what budget should you be putting there? And what's the what's the purpose of that budget? And what's the ROI that's going to come from that budget? So I don't think it's this either or. I think it's, you know, it's it's both of them together. And I think that the quicker people start to understand that and get their head around that and realise it's not a competition, um, I, I expect to see it, you know, I think that's one of the biggest barriers that we've certainly seen. Yeah. Justin, maybe we'll come to you. You know, you, you talk with broadcasters to kind of um, understand how you can work with them and, and how we can, as an industry, push forward this sort of evolution. Um, are there any kind of frequent things that come up um, that, you know, you hear about why broadcasters might be a bit slower to evolve their businesses? Yeah. So I think on the sell side, it really comes down to the complexity of enabling this uh, new addressable inventory and that the devices are very fragmented. There's many different distribution platforms and you've also got new emerging standards like HPP TV. And as I said before, until recently, the scale didn't really justify the effort, but we're now seeing some CTV platforms hit, hitting a tipping point. So Samsung claim that 58% of their watch time is now streaming. And the good news for broadcasters is 44% of that is on ad support and services. And obviously that's only the Samsung connected TV universe, but it gives you an indication as to how things are happening. But uh, to, to Emma's point, it's, it really comes down to how you start packaging all of your linear and digital inventory together. And I think the first priority is to enable this new complex inventory. And the first way people are generally going to market is con considering it an extension of their digital sales. The second stage is then packaging this as an extension of linear as well to address the concerns of some of those broadcasters that can't reach um, the consumers in the way that they wanted to in the past. But I think the end state, and we're not there yet in the UK at least, is one consolidated sales approach where you have scope for broad or narrow targeting to best serve your advertisers. I think Sky and um, ITV with Planet V are probably the furthest along in that approach now. Hmm. I think um, one, so yeah, so just, just to start looking at, I guess, what these evolved broadcasters Will actually look like um, one interesting aspect to pick up on is uh, how content is different in that sort of world. Um, Casey, maybe you can talk a bit about how discovery um, looks at this in terms of you know CCV is a different way of distributing um, your content, and we've seen sort of a, a couple of different approaches. I guess from discovery, we've seen both um, you know having different niche services which are more focused on specific types of content, and then now um, more focused towards discovery plus um, where everything's under one roof um and i've also heard some quite interesting stuff about just uh, you know opportunities around doing some more interesting stuff content wise around making it fit within the connected home so can you maybe just talk a bit, little bit about the opportunities you see in terms of the content you make and how you distribute it i mean you know first and foremost never has it been truer that content is king and broadcast quality you know content that people like Discovery have been making for years and years is still what people want to watch. And it's still what people want to watch on a large screen, generally speaking. So they'll go to the biggest screen possible. Um, and so then it's just about making sure that you are, you know, you're reaching the people who are most likely to want to access your content. And that's, as you said, you've made reference to the fact that we, you know, we've got a few different products in market. We've got some very specialist, more niche products, which tend to be more end to end, as we call it. So short form. So, so golf TV, you mentioned as an example, you know, you can have a tutorial with Tiger Woods, you can watch live sport, or you can watch documentaries about the sport. It's a real, it's really super serving um, passionate fans of that particular sport. But then equally, you know, we're now pushing forward with Discovery Plus because, you know, from a sales perspective, I think we recognise that with with connected devices and and with you know with with um, OTT, it, it's all about offering buyers scale because you can't do appropriate targeting without scale. And if you have too many niche products, you're going to struggle to have scale. So I think that's why we're kind of playing around with sort of different products, but fundamentally, what we are recognising is. You know, we need to be we need to have services that attract as many viewers as possible. Basically, um, I think just to come back to your previous question, though, on why buyers are hesitating, you know, it is that big question of mark uh, of um, of measurement. So I used to be a, a planner at Cara, you know, and, and first and foremost, what a client wants to know is what's my reach and frequency. And at the moment, we really can't give accurate reach and frequency for a mixed 
um, AV plan. And that, that is going to continue to be the slight issue and the pricing for certain audiences as well. But I think, you know, there's a lot of things in market, as we've already talked about, you know, Sea Flight with Sky, you know, other the other broadcasters are looking at that as well. We're a partner of Sky, so we, you know, we're already on board with this. Um, and obviously then there's Project Origin as well. So there's lots of things in that are in play at the moment, but it's going to be which direction do we go, I think is going to be the, the big question because measurement is going to be key from a buyer's perspective. I want to look um, some more at uh, sort of how media buying looks in, in this new world. Um, and I, I suppose we've seen quite a few interesting developments um, over the past few years. I mean, the, the pandemic has um, raised a few more questions about the upfront model, I guess. Um, and then we've also seen through products like Planet B, yeah, more interested in these sort of self-serve um, platforms. Um, so do we think that, you know, buying and selling media um, is going to look really quite different to, to what we see from the traditional TV world, or is there still going to be a place for, you know, upfront style buys and, you know, um, you know, media agencies having a bigger role in terms of their own negotiation? Um, I, I can share my opinion on that. And obviously, guys can chip in afterwards. I think that look, we definitely saw that the upfronts changed um, over the last sort of <laughs> driven by the pandemic, I think. But also, maybe it was something that was that needed to happen anyway. Um, and you started to see buyers wanting more flexibility in terms of what they bought, when they bought, when they booked it, how much they paid for it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you saw the, I you know, I genuinely believe that you saw the majority of the broadcasters and the publishers really respond positively to that need. So I think there has been that seismic in the terms of, you know, not just how people, advertisers want to buy, but also how broadcasters want to sell moving forward. And I think that there are lots of things that we've done in the digital space that we can take into, you know, the broadcast connected television space. Um, I do believe that programmatic is gonna play a huge part in terms of helping drive this flexibility. And, you know, you certainly will see that, to your point, in case, you know, the scale. Well, if you've got a if you've got a programmatic solution like Head of Bidding, for example, then that provides that level of scale that perhaps you wouldn't have had um, traditionally. It's certainly in the traditional linear TV space. And I think it also gets much more complicated when you start to think about the pan-European landscape. So if you look at the UK as the UK, that's fine. But then, you know, we are, in a, we are a region and... We, you know, there's a lot of differentiation between um, the markets that, you know, you, you reference HBB TV. Well, that's, you know, that's very predominant in some markets like Germany, less so in the UK. So how do we all balance across, across markets and what does, and, you know, how does an advertiser buy CTV PAM regionally? Um, is that even something that they can do right now? I certainly believe that that's the future, but, you know, there, there are definitely some barriers to that and we need to, we need to work together to, to, to remove some of those. I think it always strikes me that what we have here is kind of digital on the left and TV on the right. So you imagine like a Venn diagram and these two bubbles are coming together and that piece in the middle is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and more important. But both sides of the house are dissatisfied. The linear teams feel that the addressable stuff is not measured or traded in the same way. And the digital teams feel that it doesn't have the same fidelity of targeting or ability to do interactive ads. So both sides of the house are seeing this as their inventory minus, and it shouldn't. It should be seen as TV plus. It should be seen as TV with bells on. Um, because if you think about it in that way, all we're doing is incrementally adding more and more interesting features to TV advertising to make it more compelling for everybody. Um, as, as to programmatic, I think the way it's going to go to market is through programmatic guaranteed or automated guaranteed. Some of this comes down to kind of compliance requirements in various markets, um, but most broadcasters will want to review the creatives for ads. And that means that this is the best way to go to market and it gives them the ability to make sure that they're satisfied that the, the ads uh, meet, meet with their, their compliance guidelines. Um, but, you know, I think RTB is some way away if that was where your question was going, Tim. Um, until we can come up with a system that allows everybody to have this full control category clash and so forth, we're not ready yet to go to market with a proposition like that. But I do see that happening in three to five years once the majority of inventory has been digitised and people are comfortable with, um, you know, the access that they're able to get to it. But yeah, let's pick up on that question of sort of open marketplace 
um, RCV sales for TV. Do you guys think that's something that we're going to see soon down the line or is, is there not just the appetite for that sort of thing yet? I think people have to be comfortable that they know what they're getting into. And I think the first piece is access. So making sure that there is a way to um, to trade inventory over programmatic pipes uh, between DSPs and SSPs in a, in a TV landscape. I think as the scale grows, you will start to see more and more of these kind of use cases. Um, but, you know, we, we are moving from a very structured plan set up to um to one that has more capabilities and you know it may not be necessary to hit the commercial advantage in order to make everything rtb but i i do see a place for it in the future yeah i mean tv trading is obviously a very con- is, is a very controlled environment there's a finite to a certain extent amount of inventory and it has been traded in a certain way for quite a long time and i think that's that's the that's the kind of philosophical change that broadcasters are having to get their heads around is that now they've got something which actually is in, infinite potentially you know in terms of just the sheer scale of impressions that they might be delivering but how how you can trade those at the set to get the same value as you've been getting from your linear so it, 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 it there's a lot of change going on i think in broadcast at the moment in terms of yeah they need to monetize that inventory and they can't it, they can't keep it can't all keep coming from traditional tv budgets because you're just cannibalizing the revenue that's all you've got to grow the big pot not not kind of keep looking at that one that one part of the pie so yeah 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 for sure um that's what i made earlier which is understanding the role of ctv in your media plan and then that helps you decide where the budget's coming from to your point it doesn't always have to come from the traditional tv budgets it, it depends that it depends on the job that you want it to do um and i think that you know there's still some learning uh that has to happen in that space um, and then, you know, once people understand what's the role of CTV in, in the in the broader media plan, then I think that, you know, then we'll start to see, you know, that, that's a bit of a tipping point as well when people need, and then, of course, we need to be able to measure it properly as well. Mm. I want to look as well at the role specifically of, of, of data, both in terms of um, broadcasters having their own first party data tools thoroughly fleshed out, and then also the ability of, um, you know, brands to be able to bring in whatever data sets they have into the mix. Um, how important do you think those sorts of capabilities are going to be? Um, you know, are they are they vital essentially for broadcasters, you know, in the next few years, or are they more kind of nice to have? I think that first party data, data capabilities are is, is, is essential. Um, I think that if I just reference the the research that we've just that we've just done. I think that if we think about the UK, a lot of the respondents from the UK TV industry said that the ability to use data for targeting and to open up TV advertising to a wider pool of advertisers represented a big opportunity, if not the biggest opportunity for future growth. Um, so I think that you know it's absolutely vital if if we're going to grow the industry. And it's a new capability as well. Broadcasters have never had this opportunity to get directly to the consumer before as they now do in, in the OTT space. Previously on linear, you broadcast it out and everybody sees the same sees the same picture. So I think it really comes down to packaging. Um, so, you know, whether a broadcaster wants to create those audiences, sports fans or, um, or, or whatever that needs to be and how, how compelling can these audiences and attributes be uh, to, to the advertisers. Um, I think third-party data is a little less prevalent in the OTT and CTV space at the moment, but there's definitely a big untapped opportunity with first-party data. Yeah, I want to look at as well a little bit at uh, the relationships with um, the newer sort of CTV platforms, because obviously one of the, the interesting things about this change is that um, the the companies which are acting, I guess, as the gatekeepers in the space, um, the CTV platforms, the Roku's, the Amazons. Um, uh, are different from you know the, the telcos um, and we we've started to hear about uh, more of in the state side i think but about um you know carriage negotiations uh, resulting in at times services not being carried on those platforms for a little while um casey maybe you can give just a broadcast perspective there on how how do you approach those relationships is that sort of a worry for you at the moment that um you know you become kind of beholden to roku demanding its fee or is that not really much of a concern for you right now I think it's all, you know, we're used to, as a company that was founded on, you know, cable, we, we are used to having partners in business. And so that that hasn't been challenging for us. You know, I think 
we were you know really proud of the fact that when we launched discovery plus in the us on the 4th of jan we actually had we were on platform on a lot of platforms that a lot of the other uh, big svod services hadn't launched on so we were on roku we were on amazon and you know, yes, you go into partnership with those. And as long as you're, it, uh, it, is, it is at a level that makes sense for you and that, you know, ultimately that distribution is what's important and being able to get in front of those eyeballs is what's important. So, you know, I think we see, you know, and in the UK in particular, we purposely made sure that we had a launch partner in Sky because we knew, because we knew that that was going to immediately catapult us into more homes. Um, so, yeah, partnerships are incredibly important for someone like discovery plus we we you know we really we really think they're valuable and and justin i, I just want to touch quickly on your experience sort of representing google and starting to talk about um with broadcasters about how you can work with them um you know you hear you know some broadcasters might be a bit concerned about um google you know moving into the tv space um and sort of giving up control maybe of their um you know uh, management of sales you know how how do you kind of talk with those broadcasters and how do you ease those concerns well you know we we operate in a highly competitive space and we have many competitors on on both the buy and the sell side and you know our role here is to help broadcasters rise to the challenge of digital and you know adapt to this privacy safe world and you know leaning into open platforms and new standards to to kind of grow the size of the pie for everybody and most of my conversations are on the sell side where we're using new technology to unlock uh, these new inventory types so that they can uh, kind of realize this shift to digital based on the consumer behavior changes. Yeah. Um, fabulous. And then I guess just to, to kind of close up, I want to look at what the steps are that the industry as a whole um, can be taking to sort of accelerate um, evolution, you know, from broadcasters um, and, and the newer entrants as well. Um, I guess one thing that comes up a lot is uh, collaboration and cooperation between broadcasters. How important do you all think that is? Is that essential? Um, do we have to move into a new world where uh, the broadcasters are all holding hands and singing songs together? Um, or can it be kept kind of minimal in terms of maybe just making sure um, your inventory is all uh, available on shared platforms, but um, without being too closely aligned? What, what do you think that collaboration looks like? I think that there are that there are numerous ways that you can collaborate. I haven't thought of the uh, holding hands and singing songs together. That one is not on my list, but you know, whatever. <laughs> I think that you know one of the things that we've heard consistently is that it's it's collaboration on common technology standards that needs to be more firmly established, um, certainly in the European market. And I think that that's going to require constant review. Um, and so I think that's really important. I think actually clar clarify the definition of CTV as well. So again, if you go into different markets, what's CTV to one person is something completely different to somebody else. And we've already, already referenced other protocols like HBB TV, for example. So some, some clarity and some consistency around the definition of CTV, I think would also help. Um, yeah, so I think those those are two 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 important things. I'm sure there are many others that, that the other um, panelists will have a view on. Uh, I can pick up the HPV TV piece because I think that's a really good example where the industry can work together on, to get this emergent standard up to scratch. And the goal here is that we can actually replace live TV ads on connected smart TVs. And we we kind of have proof proof of concepts and you know some demonstrations that show it can be done but through collaborations between the tv manufacturers and the broadcasters and the tech providers we can make it really really work so that all the tvs all the new tvs work in the same way and we can grow the opportunity and you know i think as as previously discussed developing new measurement and targeting approaches that are digital in nature, but compatible with linear TV to allow broadcasters to go to market with a total TV proposition in a privacy safe way is the way we want to grow this market. I think there are, sorry, Kato, I think there are a lot of we can take from, from the digital language. It's not like you know, it's the birth of the internet. There are lots of things that, we, that we've all been doing for the last 20 years that we can take into this into this environment. So we can sort of hit the ground running a little bit. It's not like we have to learn everything from scratch again. I think all I was gonna say is, 
you know, just thinking about it from a from an advertiser's perspective, it's about simplicity. And at the moment, you know, they have no idea of the complexity of for us, a broadcaster who has a significant amount of resource trying to get onto, as you said, all of this plethora of different platforms in multiple markets with different requirements. You know, it feels like it shouldn't be that difficult and yet it is incredibly difficult and an advertiser is entirely unaware of all of that stuff that's going on so i think the sooner we can we can get to a position where it is back to being about buying tv in its broadest sense knowing you know being able to target being able to target better where appropriate um but not always you know not all campaigns need to be highly targeted but i think it is about you know, how can we make it as easy as possible for the most important people who are advertisers to be able to reach the people they need to reach, right? Absolutely. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the conversation there because we are out of time. Uh, but I think we covered quite a lot of ground in quite a short space of time. So uh, thank you very much to each of my panellists. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.